also welcoming back Nick Courtright, our next poet. Nick Courtright is the executive editor of Atmosphere Press and co-executive editor of Gold Wake Press. He is the author of Let There Be Light and Punchline, a national poetry series finalist. He's completing doctoral work at the University of Texas and lives with his two children in East Austin. Please welcome Nick. How's it going? Great. Great. Good? Good. Good? Is it okay? Oh man, we have a very uneven room here. It's like, sorry. No. Uh, <laughs> okay, sweet. So, uh, I'm going to start with a poem uh, called Political Poem. Very inventive title. <clears throat> One time, I went on a hike. I was listening for endangered spotted owls in the deep forest at night. I heard nothing. I heard nothing. I heard the wind pass through leaves as if through a ship's sails. I heard nothing. When I was on this hike, I came across a swath of clear-cut forest. Hundreds of Douglas firs laid still on the ground like bodies. It was eerie how still they were, like bodies. When I tried to hike, they were always in my way. No matter what I could do, the dead trees were there, broken before me, hulking masses of broad tinder. It was very difficult to walk, and very dangerous. I couldn't hear a fucking owl for the life of me. All the trees were dead, well not all, just the ones who didn't stand up for their rights. Some say that's how victims are made through silence. Here's a poem uh, about my dog putting a baby blue jay in her mouth. Uh, the poem is called, Here's a Poem About My Dog Putting a Baby Blue Jay in Her Mouth. I just wrote that on there. Uh, okay. The fresh bird was on the seat, the top of the seat, by the campfire ring waterlogged still from the dream of rain I had. And this bird was fresh because so young, its wings barely beyond down. The bird had worked hard, like coal, to get to the top of the sea. It was an accomplishment, like breaking someone's heart. And then now who's this? Entering the scene from stage left, which is right to you, it is Maya. It is the grand illusion that is all reality. The ghostly fabric of time and space and apples. No, it is Maya, who is a dog, a white dog smiling with its happy tail knocking about. And in her nonchalance, she saunters to the bird to say hello. But why are you here in my world? And then she puts her mouth around the bird. I see the bird try to flap away. It wants so badly to be free. It is really quite upset. It is a moth in a web. And then Maya, white dog, puts down the bird. A blue jay now, I can tell. Its parents making a racket and swinging like props from the rafters. And the squirrels, too, are chuckling with delight. This really is a phenomenal scene in my backyard. And the bird is hopping around on the ground. This little thing I can see with its downy blue and dreams of who knows what. The dog walks away bored as if reading. The bird just hopping around, hopping, hopping. This fresh bird, its wing is not right. Neither is its leg. And we know how this will end. Ruminants. Here at Machu Picchu, it is exactly as you'd expect. Beautiful, impressive, it will be all the photos say it will be. How many photos of Machu Picchu is enough, I wonder, as I take a photo of Machu Picchu. Humans are crawling all over this thing, and it is a monument to primate accomplishment and absurdity. What a location. The Inca had ambition, and then they died. 
But the Inca were just the kings. The people were Quechua. They may or may not have had ambition, and then they died. The sounds of a weed whacker disrupt the vigil for all those dead being kept by no one. A large millipede with red legs walks across the ruins, and I am proud to have found him. A fly bites my ankle. My feet are tired. I am a spoiled American who is a voyeur on the heritage of those who have heritage. A flock of tourists follows two camelids like paparazzi, and I say camelid because I don't feel 100% certain saying they are llamas and not alpacas, though I'm pretty sure they are llamas. I looked at a chart. Trying to tell the difference between a llama and alpaca, I wonder about how to lend meaning to my life. At Machu Picchu, the bus that takes people to Machu Picchu contributes to erosion that will end Machu Picchu. Every single person on this earth is just bumbling along. Both llamas and alpacas know this to be true. So, have any of you guys been to that uh, farmer's market over in Mueller? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, no, yell, like own it. You're like, yeah, I went there to that hangar, I got that stuff, it was really expensive, um, but very high quality. Uh, so they have sometimes this thing there, there's like a little thing where you can go and you can like, hold various animals, oh, yeah. uh, you know, and pay, and they have all these little animals that you can hold, it's very like pleasant. Um, so uh, I wrote a poem about it. Uh, because it's weird. Uh, the poem's called Five Dollars for Ten Minutes. Because that's how much it costs. Ten minutes, five bucks. I can't say the horned lizard wanted anything else. There it lay on its mat as if it knew the answers. The hedgehog, on, their, on the other hand, nose twitchy, very much wanted something else. It fled or tried to flee, though its handler, teenager, said, raise your hand if it cannot hold the animal. It cannot hold the animal. I raise my hand, a grown man. In this hand is a bunny rabbit, one of those fluffy ones and now high in the air. It has become aware of the problem of its own life. Floppy long ears. To be a part of this cost five dollars for ten minutes. Adults welcome. That's fifty cents for ten minutes per minute to be able to say next animal please. Each animal is in a hand or in a basket. Secure the lid. So many hands, so many baskets. See, this is where we're supposed to draw some conclusions. Grand ones about more than the farmer's market. Like, what it all means. Like, the relationship between the in control and those who serve. Like, what happens after we die. Yeah, the horned lizard knows. The hedgehog, secure the lid, does not. The bunny, it's just up there, in the air, held high. Because this world is class, and it, the student, has a question. I'm going to read two more poems. Uh, this one is about uh, going on a safari in Africa with someone, and then breaking up with the person you went on the safari in Africa with. Uh, it's called Before Falling Out of Love. I couldn't really make sense of my happiness. There were zebras in the distance, and when one turned beside the other, I could not tell where one began and the other was also a zebra. Weather was not alone and neither was I, though in both cases the situation was temporary. You were there, and I couldn't make sense of it. <coughs> You wore a scarf, and I wore a scarf, and if we got out of the vehicle, someone would probably die, so we stayed in the vehicle. They say elephants have excellent memories, so if I came back to Wander Sabo, would they remember me? Would they remember a man in the time before the man made decisions? 
Under a tree, a warthog tries to hold its ground against five large hornbills, and then, oh well, the warthog can't hold its ground. Now it's the one cooking in the sun, and the giraffe looks like a damn fool when it tries to enjoy the water hole. It has to spread its legs so far apart. Zebras are just too crazy to domesticate, says Moses. And I trust him more than I trust Swale, who lights the joint. Though I suppose that when it comes down to it, I trust Swale too, and also Mustafa and Muhammad. Eventually, I'll be back in my bed in America after having set my family on fire. And outside, the storm rattles its chains and my windows, and before I know it, that too will be just a memory. <coughs> uh, it's my last poem. I'd like to uh, thank Malvern. Can we get a round of applause for Malvern? <laughs> Also, of course, to all of you guys coming out and to my fellow readers, uh, it's always a pleasure to be here. So now I'm going to uh, read a poem about uh, telling my son, uh, basically, like, just, like, wanting him to, like, use a hatchet and, like, be, uh, you know, self-aware uh, and, uh, you know, able to do things on his own, uh, even if it seems, like, dangerous or completely unwise. This is called The Next Generation. If the child says, I am bored, I say, do you want the hatchet? Of course the child wants the hatchet. The child says, where is it? You can find it in the garage, I say, but I will not help you find it. It is in the dark place in the garage. Look for the dark place and there you will find the hatchet is with the spiders. Go where the spiders are, I say. And then a miracle occurs. This is the miracle. The hatchet glinting its glint in the noontime sun. The child learns to use it. He uses it well. He wields it like a dream of peace between the factions of stubborn nations. And this is how I show my love. My love is too large. All night and all day I think of love. I think of the child, my child, in the backyard standing next to the tree that used to be our Christmas tree. I see him there. And in his hand, his strong, small, strong, weak child's hand, raised high, the hatchet. Thank you.